You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So Glenn, things have gone from bad to worse in Trump's criminal trial as prosecutors had their first opportunity today to make their case against Trump. But first, just a quick reminder for those watching that we are in the midst of Trump's first criminal trial in Manhattan. Glenn and I will be doing daily comprehensive coverage. So if you want to follow along for our daily updates, our legal updates here, please make sure to subscribe to both of our channels. Okay, so Glenn, we spoke in our last episode about prosecutors making their case to the judge about what uncharged misconduct will be allowed to be presented to the jury in what's called a Sandoval hearing. How did that turn out for Trump? It didn't turn out so well, Brian. Now, first of all, Judge Mershon said he will issue his final ruling on Monday, but some of what he said was pretty ominous and it spells real trouble for Trump. Let me give the viewers just a flavor of some of the uncharged misconduct that the prosecutors are seeking to introduce at trial in the event Donald Trump takes the stand and tries to testify in his own defense. They want to introduce the civil fraud judgment against him to the tune of nearly half a billion dollars. They want to introduce findings by the judge that he lied under oath in that case. They want to introduce the E. Jean Carroll verdicts, both of them. They want to introduce, for example, the dissolution of the fraudulent Trump charity. Um, and then I, I think this is really the most dire. And I think what Judge Mershon said today about this last one that I want to read a little bit about for our viewers. He said, if this isn't Sandoval evidence, in other words, if this isn't admissible, I don't know what is. And here is what Judge Mershon was talking about. And Brian, I want to ask our viewers to just pretend that they are jurors and they're going to be asked to judge Donald Trump's credibility in this trial. And here is some of what it looks like they're going to learn. So the prosecutors are going to present this evidence that another court sanctioned Trump and ordered to pay him nearly half a million dollars in fees for filing a frivolous bad faith lawsuit. And here is what the judge said about him. Quote, here we are confronted with a lawsuit that should never have been filed, which was completely frivolous, both factually and legally, and which was brought by defendant Trump in bad faith for an improper purpose. Mr. Trump is a prolific and sophisticated litigant who is repeatedly using the courts to seek revenge on political adversaries. He is the mastermind of strategic abuse of judicial process, and he cannot be seen as a litigant blindly following the advice of a lawyer. He knew full well the impact of his actions. That had to do with him bringing a bad faith lawsuit, weaponizing the courts to try to get after who? Hillary Clinton, a political opponent. What are the allegations in this case for which he's on trial that he paid hush money and then fraudulently falsified business records to cover up the nature of those hush money payments? Why? Because he was trying to gain unfair advantage in an election, the 2016 presidential election. If you hear as a juror that another judge made those findings about Donald Trump weaponizing and abusing the court system for political advantage, how are you going to assess Donald Trump's credibility? Yeah. Did, did the judge give any indication one way or the other as to how he might rule on the permissibility of all of these examples of misconduct? That was the one, that last one where I just read the excerpt, that was the one that prompted Judge Mershon to say, if that is not admissible Sandoval evidence, then what is? That's the one where he really tipped his hand. Now, there's another one. Remember the Trump Organization? Two companies of the Trump Organization stood trial and were convicted, criminally convicted, in that same courtroom, presided over by that same judge, of 17 felonies for being involved in a 15-year-long criminal scheme to defraud. Um, but Donald Trump wasn't a defendant in that case. The prosecutors are trying to introduce evidence of that one as well. If I had to predict, I have a feeling Judge Mershon will say, well, you know what? I'm going to be, you know, uh, Solomon-esque in my splitting of the difference here. I'm not going to permit that one to be introduced, but I am going to permit all these other ones to be introduced where Donald Trump was the party, the litigant the one who lied, the one who defrauded, the one who weaponized the court system for political advantage. But we will know what Judge Mershon's ruling is on all of this come Monday. 
I think we have enough examples for the rest of that stuff to give the jury a clear indication of who Donald Trump is. But to that point, whether the jury actually hears any of this ultimately hinges on whether Trump himself opts to testify. I've read rumblings online that Trump does want to testify. Of course, you got to take that all with a grain of salt. What do you presume will happen here? There's not a chance in hell Donald Trump is going to hit the stand. The reason I say that <laughs> is twofold. One, Donald Trump has been promising us over and over again that he will take the stand. But Brian, what does history teach us about what happens when Donald Trump promises he's going to testify? He promised he would testify in the Mueller investigation, and he didn't. He promised he would testify in both E. Jean Carroll trials. He testified in neither. And then finally, he said, OK, I'm going to try to take the stand in my New York civil fraud case. And our viewers may remember, he hit the stand. He was on for about 90 seconds. He couldn't even answer questions in a responsive fashion. He was admonished by the judge and he slunk back to his counsel table. So it really wasn't, you know, a blockbuster performance. There is no way in hell. Donald Trump is going to take the stand in this criminal case. All right, well, fair enough. I think, uh, I think your dollar bet is probably safe on that one. Glenn, jury selection is now complete. It took only one week, which, to your credit, you predicted at the outset of all of this. What do you make of the speed of the trial thus far? So first of all, the speed of jury selection is a testament to one really smart thing Judge Mershon did. During jury selection, he brought the first 100 jurors in, and he said, Anyone who thinks they can't sit fairly and impartially in this case, raise your hand. Fifty hands went up. He summarily dismissed those people rather than questioning them one after another after another to probe why they thought they couldn't be fair. That turned out to be really smart in hindsight because he got rid of all the people who kind of opted out. They, you know, self-described that they couldn't be fair. So that reduced the amount of time he had to spend questioning all of the remaining jurors to see if they could be fair. And in about three or three and a half trial days, a jury of 12 and six alternates have been seated. So the pace of jury selection was, you know, virtually at light speed. Then the question becomes, as we move forward to opening statements on Monday, um, do things begin to bog down or does Judge Mershon keep things moving swiftly and efficiently the way he always has thus far, and frankly, the way he did in the Trump Organization criminal trial that he presided over. I think the bad news for Donald Trump is the judge presiding on this case, Juan Mershon, is smart, he's efficient, he's fearless, and he really is ruling without favor. So I think we will continue to see this um, trial progress at a pretty good clip. Glenn, is there anything about the jury selection process that worries you or that's worried you thus far? Because I know we spoke in, in a previous episode about certain statements that jury members have made that might signal like an openness or an interest in Donald Trump. Yeah, you know, I have confidence in Judge Mershon and in the prosecution team to have gauged the answers that each juror gave. And if both the judge and the prosecutors decided that the juror could be fair and impartial, even if they had, you know, tendencies one way or another, um, I am going to trust their judgment. Of course, I don't factor in the defense team's assessment of the jurors because they're not looking for fair and impartial right. jurors. They're looking for the most pro-Trump jurors they can get without those jurors being disqualified for bias. Um, but, you know, the other thing that concerns me, well, first and foremost, is juror safety. And I hope they're taking all necessary precautions to make sure each juror is safe, including, you know, safe traveling to the courtroom every day, safe traveling back home at the end of every trial day. I trust they're taking those precautions. But the only other thing that concerns me a little bit is Judge Mershon opted to seat only six alternate jurors. Six ordinarily sounds like a lot. I can tell our viewers the norm in a criminal trial is you seat 12 regular jurors and two alternates, and that's usually fine because, you know, maybe one juror falls ill during the trial. Maybe one juror has a family emergency or gets an offender bender and lands in the hospital. Then you have to replace that kind of a juror with an alternate. Here, the calculation is completely different, right? Here, Donald Trump's rhetoric, his violence-inducing rhetoric, his insistence on violating court orders, including gag orders, 
you know, leads to all sorts of trouble and all sorts of mischief with witnesses and jurors, not to mention prosecutors, judges, and their family members. So assuming Donald Trump keeps it up, and I think he will at least until Judge Mershon is perhaps compelled to sentence him for criminal contempt. That hearing is going to be Tuesday. And part of the authorized punishment is jail time. That might, that might quiet Donald Trump down a bit because yeah. they will not allow him to have his cell phone in a cell and post things that threaten jurors and witnesses. So, you know, we'll stay tuned to that. Um, but I am a little bit concerned that if more than six jurors, regular jurors, end up for some reason falling out because they feel threatened or because somehow, you know, they, they have been reached by someone, um, then we're going to be struggling to get through the end of the trial with a full complement of 12 regular jurors. That's the one thing that gives me pause. I don't know why unless there is some local New York regulation or rule prohibiting more than six alternates, and I would be surprised if there is, it might have made sense to kind of pad the alternates a little bit, maybe eight, ten alternates. But, yeah. you know, as of right now, they're going to be up and running. They've got six alternates, and hopefully that will see them through the end of the trial. All right. Well, look, we have a big week coming up. Monday, we have the, the decision from Judge Mershon with regard to the Sandoval hearing, what uncharged... Um, misconduct will be permissible uh, for the jury. And then Tuesday, we have the hearing uh, related to the gag order to determine whether Trump is hit with fines and or uh, a 30-day jail sentence, which is the maximum. So big week coming up next week for those watching right now. If you want to be able to follow along with all of that, we're going to be doing daily comprehensive coverage. So please make sure to subscribe. The links to both of our channels, my channel and Glenn's channel, are right here on the screen. So make sure to hit subscribe on both of those. I'm Brian Teller-Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.